All right, great. Thank you everyone for joining us for the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. I'm Matt Schultz with the Sustainable Phosphorus uh, Alliance and our topic today is those ele other elements, nitrogen and carbon interactions with phosphorus. A bit about who we are, the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, if you don't know already, is a members organization that serves North America as a central forum and advocate for the sustainable use, recovery, and recycling of phosphorus in the food system. And I want to stress that we're a members organization. We have a, you see on the right here, a number of organizations that have supported us over the years. And this webinar series would not be possible without their help. If you think that this webinar series is useful and valuable and you have uh, and you've seen some of the other work that the Alliance has done over the years and want to join us and uh, be part of our team and help support us, please reach out to us via our website at phosphorusalliance.org and uh, we'll get your organization signed up as a as a member. We don't do memberships for individuals just for organizations. However, there are plenty of other opportunities for engaging us as an individual via our various social media platforms and events, including this one. So uh, one other announcement is that we have a big event planned for November 1st through 4th, 2022, and that is Phosphorus Week. So we typically run a Phosphorus Forum event on an annual basis, and this is an event for industry, government, academics, NGOs to come together and discuss phosphorus uh, in, a, in a holistic manner. And everyone to sort of come out of their silos, this opportunity for everyone to kind of come out of their silos and look across the phosphorus value chain and interact and network with one another and hear some interesting talks from people. Um, but we're combining that this year with the international event, the Sustainable Phosphorus Summit. And this event happens only every two years, typically. It was, we missed this last cycle because of COVID. And it usually, um, it, it happens on a different continent every year. So this time it's coming to the US and we're combining both these events into one week in Raleigh, North Carolina um, called Phosphorus Week. So we'll have a registration site up for this probably in about a, week, uh, about a month. And please uh, keep an eye out for various announcements. Again, if you want to stay abreast of these sorts of announcements, you can uh, follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, and also you can sign up for our newsletter at our phosphorusalliance.org website under the contacts tab. So I hope you can make it out to this. It'll be a great event. Um, we have really a star-studded cast of speakers today, and I'm going to read their bios as they begin uh, their talks. But uh, this is a very exciting webinar for me. These are some big names in ecology, and uh, I want to sort of tee up the discussion uh, now with a bit of background about our topic. So, uh, you know, both the webinar series and the work of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance have, as their names indicate, focused on phosphorus. And we're sometimes asked why we're not the Sustainable Nutrient Alliance. Um, it's a question we really ask ourselves too once in a while. After all, we've drastically increased the amounts of all three nutrients cycling through our ecosystems, through mining, and through the magic of chemistry. And these increases have each had profound ecological consequences. Um, the truth is, though, you have to draw your ambition line somewhere, and phosphorus sustainability is really plenty for our little organization to try to tackle. Uh, that said, we have to understand that we can't address phosphorus sustainability without consideration of these other cycles. This fact was really never lost on us. And indeed our director, Dr. Jim Elser wrote one of the key scholarly works on these cycles and how they interact ecologically. And we'll, we'll get a, a shot of that book uh, later in the presentation. Um, so how are these cycles changing? How do they interact? What are the consequences of those interactions? And what do we do about the adverse impacts that they generate? Uh, well, that uh, these changes generate. Well, that's exactly what the topic of today's webinar is. We're going to explore how these cycles connect and how imbalances among nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus impact not just our ecosystems, but our social systems as well. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we're joined by three of the world's top ecologists today, and Drs. Elizabeth Borer, Borer Jose Penuelas, and uh, Jim Elser. Uh, professors Borer and Penuelas will each provide presentations, as will Jim Elser at the beginning here, and um, uh, Jim, of course, is our, our Stable Phosphorus Alliance director. And uh, he'll also facilitate a discussion at the end of the three talks and um, among, the, among the panelists. 
So um, without further ado, I think we can go ahead and introduce our director, Dr. Jim Elser. Professor Elser is a limnologist uh, and he was just last week officially inducted into the National Academy of Sciences at their ceremony in DC. Um, his research is focused on the effects of limiting uh, key nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus in lake ecosystems. He's a research professor and distinguished sustainability science scientist at ASU's School of Life Sciences and School of Sustainability and serves as the director of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. He's also director of the Flathead Lake Biological Station uh, for the University of Montana. And Jim, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Matt, and thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion later with Elizabeth and Joseph. So those of you tuning in today are probably, uh, as part of the Phosphorus Alliance activities, may be familiar with the fact that I have a unusually strong interest in the element phosphorus, some would might call it an obsession. And perhaps you know the book I published last year with uh, Phil Hager that came out. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff about phosphorus in this book. But, um, and so I am very much focused on fox, phosphorus as a really fascinating element. But as Matt mentioned earlier, in earlier life, I published another paper. What happened there? Uh, another book called Ecological Stoichiometry with my colleague, uh, Bob Sterner, uh, published by Princeton Press in 2002. Now, stoichiometry is kind of an ugly word, so let me define it for you. The dictionary calls stoichiometry the relationship between the relative quantities of substances taking part in a reaction or forming a compound, typically a ratio of whole, whole integers. That's a little bit of a mouthful. So I like to think of uh, the stoichiometry of something as the elemental recipe of something. That is what proportions of key elements like carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus do you have to put together to make a particular molecule or some other um, entity. And so what we do in this book uh, that we published is we lay out the framework of what is called ecological stoichiometry, where we take the same way of thinking about uh, the, the regular rules about how carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus have to come together in molecules, and molecules make up cells, and cells make up organisms. Those rules then have important implications for how organisms perform in the environment and how they interact with each other and how ecosystems um, uh, behave. And so this is the whole um, of a field <laughs> that allows us a formal way of connecting um, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus uh, together. So I'm gonna give you a brief example of this and how we're working on this concept of stoichiometric imbalance that uh, Joseph and, and Elizabeth will talk about later as well and how that impinges on ecological dynamics in ecosystems. And we can do this by um, showing you some data in Flathead Lake is a beautiful, large lake in Western Montana where I now work. I'm looking out the window in my office here. I can see the shoreline of it right there. And it uh, turns out that this lake is quite stoichiometrically imbalanced as we'll see, but naturally it seems that we can't identify any major anthropogenic or human causes of this imbalance. Joseph will talk about this later. Um, but in, this, in the case of Flathead Lake, we see that it is in fact stoichiometrically imbalanced. And so here we have long-term record at this lake of the total concentration of total nitrogen in the lake water, going back to the early 1980s. Total phosphorus in the lake water is shown down here. Uh, going back again, the same period, nutrient levels are generally low and especially the phosphorus levels are unusually low in this lake. They're not changing over time, which is really good. But if you divide the nitrogen data by the phosphorus data on any given day or observation period, you can calculate the N to P ratio of the, those nutrients. That is how many nitrogens you have for every phosphorus that you have. And what we see in Flathead Lake is that the ratio is extremely imbalanced. There's much more nitrogen associated in this lake with the phosphorus than we might um, normally see. I've dr drawn a dotted line down here in blue, which is a more balanced N to P ratio of 16 nitrogens for every phosphorus atom. And that's more or less what we see in the ocean. It's more or less what we think the basic cellular requirements are for many organisms. And so we can see in this lake that this lake is extremely imbalanced in the direction of nitrogen with very high N to P ratios. So that's interesting, fascinating from a biogeochemical perspective, I guess. 
But the question then would be, well, like, what does this mean? Is there any uh, consequence of that? And so we've been working on that. One thing we might expect is that if there's so much nitrogen in the water and not very much phosphorus, that the phytoplankton growing in that water might run out of phosphorus first. And that's in fact what happens if we do an experiment where we go out in the lake and collect lake water, add nitrogen or alone or nitrogen with phosphorus, we see that nothing happens if we just add nitrogen by itself. But if we add phosphorus, we can stimulate the growth of the phytoplankton uh, in this lake, at least in midsummer when growing conditions are favorable. All right, so that's one thing that we can say happens when a lake becomes stoichiometrically imbalanced. What else happens? Well, phytoplankton that are limited by phosphorus tend to make cells that have high nitrogen to phosphorus and carbon to phosphorus ratios. They pack on a lot of carbon for every phosphorus atom that they have. And so the particulate matter that's out there in the lake tends to have high carbon to phosphorus and nitrogen to phosphorus ratios. And in fact, in Flatted Lake, there are 400 carbon atoms for every one phosphorus atom in that particulate matter. It's stoichiometrically imbalanced with respect to the more, the more moderate ratios I mentioned earlier. Now, it turns out, why does that matter? It turns out because this is what zooplankton eat, the microscopic crustaceans that filter feed in the water. This is their food. And essentially, high carbon to phosphorus ratios in food like this means it's sort of junk food for zooplankton. Imbalanced stoichiometry means that the zooplankton themselves might become phosphorus limited. And that's what's shown in this graph here, where we're manipulating the amount of food that the animals are given. We're measuring their growth rate, but we have unamended particulate matter, phytoplankton, if you will, and uh, particulate matter that's been enriched with P. It has a lower carbon to phosphorus ratio. It's more nutritious. And in fact, we can stimulate the growth of this important herbivore in this lake. And so hopefully, um, I've convinced you or shown you uh, an interesting example, at least, of a stoichiometrically imbalanced system and uh, what it means for food webs. Here's another example. My last one I'll show you. Stoichiometric imbalance also can change the toxins that phytoplankton produce during algal blooms. And so this is uh, data that were compiled from the literature by myself and some colleagues. We're looking at the change in toxin production by harmful algae that are uh, present in lakes. And when they develop imbalanced N to P ratios in their cells, because they're being supplied with nitrogen and phosphorus in imbalanced ratios, the production of toxins is elevated, especially you see that up here with the nitrogen-based toxins. Essentially, the cells are doing, when they have excess nitrogen, they have more nitrogen on their hands than they know what to do with, so they do uh, bad things with it. It turns out they make toxins with it. And this is um, one reason why we get the uh, harmful algal bloom production and the toxicity that we see. So hopefully we'll have time to come back and talk more about this later, but now I'm going to um, let uh, Liz Elizabeth Bohr take over and tell us uh, about the terrestrial side of things. Yeah, great, Jim. And um, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to put that into the, use the Zoom Q&A feature in order to uh, send those questions off. There aren't any in the box now, but we can come back to Jim's talk later with questions if anyone thinks of any in the interim. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just introduce uh, Elizabeth Bohr by way of a short bit of bio first. Um, so um, Professor Bohr is co-founder and co-lead of Nutrient Network, a global scientific cooperative studying the effects of global changes on critical processes and functions in the world's grasslands. Now, this is to be one of the most ambitious experimental designs I've ever seen. The Nutrient Network, begun in 2007, now includes over 300 scientists performing identically replicated experiments and observations at about 160 sites in 29 countries spanning six continents. Uh, Borer is also active in the U.S. National Science Foundation long-term ecological research program, is a subject matter editor for two scientific society journals and regularly serves on national and international scientific panels. She's a lifetime fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Ecological Science of America, a Le Leopold Leadership Fellow, received the 2015 Alphonse J. Pochon, I hope I'm saying that right, Foundation Award, 
for the betterment of mankind. And for the, uh, with that, Elizabeth, I'll pass it on to you. All right, super. Thanks for that introduction, Matt. And thanks for the great introduction, Jim, because you just uh, talked about some stuff I want to tell about. So thank you all for showing up to hear what uh, is up, Jim, and I have to say, but I also really appreciate your open-mindedness and spending some time hearing about what all those other elements are doing in ecosystems. So I'm going to start with this image here, summer of 2014 in Toledo, Ohio. That's a city on one of the biggest freshwater lakes in the world. The city lost its drinking water because of a massive toxic algae bloom in Lake Erie, just like what Jim was talking about. And this is just one example why a lot of people, probably people on this call, get into the business of thinking about sustainable phosphorus. Not enough in the egg fields, so we add it, but then too much in the lakes. But we don't just add phosphorus to increase agricultural production. Again, making uh, reiterating Jim's point here. So I know a lot of talks in the webinar have focused on phosphorus and time and space, but we know that agricultural fertilizer contains a lot of different nutrients. Nitrogen and phosphorus and a host of other elements are added in agriculture. And these end up in the water feeding other, you know, unintended primary producers like those algae that I showed you in Lake Erie. So I'm gonna focus on the interplay of nitrogen and phosphorus. I'm gonna include some carbon in the story too. Um, and honestly, I probably won't be able to stop myself from talking about some of the other elements as well. So through agriculture, among other human activities, global cycles of elements are intimately linked. And this is just a graph showing you uh, through time, the increase in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilizers, um, each tracking the other because that's what makes plants grow. So I wanted to introduce today's players individually first. I'll start with phosphorus. We've been mining phosphate rock for about 100 years to fuel agriculture and to feed a growing human population. And everyone on this webinar is probably already knowledgeable enough about phosphorus to be interested in its sustainable use. So I'm not gonna spend a lot more time introducing this player. But it's not a coincidence that the Haber-Bosch process, that's the one that makes agricultural ammonia. It was invented in the early 1900s and it was taken up to industrial scale around the world in the decades following that at about the same time as that rapid increase in phosphate rock mining. And because of this innovation, ammonium, nitrate, and urea that are all used in agriculture are among the highest volume chemicals that are currently made on earth by humans. So the Haber-Bosch process is also extremely energy intensive. It breaks apart unreactive nitrogen in the atmosphere, right? Our atmosphere, when you clap your hands, it doesn't explode, right? It's an incredibly stable molecule and it combines those nitrogens with hydrogen. That huge amount of energy contained in that NH molecule of nitrogen fertilizer, that can be seen in explosives, among other things. That the Haber-Bosch process consumes about 5% of the world's annual natural gas production. That's just astounding to me, right? And that use of energy, that brings me to carbon. The, story of carbon emissions and the link to regional and global climate, the changes in both temperature and precipitation has been relatively well told, but that link to nitrogen fertilizer in particular, that's less widely understood. So can we just keep adding nitrogen and phosphorus to ecosystems to make more plants? And I think Jim made that point a little bit, but I wanna make that some more. That question contains the concept of a limiting nutrient. So in the 1800s, a guy named uh, Eustace von Liebig came up with a pretty handy analogy for this. This is as staves in a barrel. So with each element representing one stave, the analogy for growth limitation is how much water can be stored in that barrel. The shortest stave is the one that limits how much water can be held or you know, that's the plant growth. When a longer stave is added, so more of that element is being supplied, more plant growth can occur until another one becomes more limiting. And it's kind of a useful way to visualize that need for a balance of elements. But like any analogy, I would say this one is pretty limited. There are 25 elements that make up an organism and organisms invest a whole lot of energy in maintaining a careful balance of each of those elements. 
a shortfall of more than one may limit growth. It may not just be one or on the other side of it, you know, maybe more than one needs to be supplied for the organism to begin growing. And I'll give you one example, which is uh, nitrogen fixation. So that's the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen into NH molecules by bacteria that uh, we think of as associated with legumes. So nitrogen fixation, it requires carbohydrates. They have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. It also requires iron and molybdenum. So let's think about adding carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? And that may increase carbohydrate production in those plants, but that would then lead to increased demand for nitrogen, which would then lead to demand for molybdenum and iron, and, right? So it's a, a downstream impact that may lead to growth limitation by any one of those elements or likely several at the same time. So that reality is that growth limitation is determined by the balance of different elements. This is just another way of talking through what Jim just introduced. And we're changing that balance. One of the most important ways that we're changing that ratio of supply, or as Jim calls it, stoichiometry, it's through nitrogen emissions from agriculture, from fossil fuels. These nitrogen gases move through the atmosphere, they can move away from their source, and, and nitrogen is really highly soluble in water, so it can be dissolved and deposited by rain into non-agricultural settings, like you can see on this map, in less than a century, right? Again, that same timeline of this massive increase in nitrogen and phosphorus for agriculture, uh, human activities have more than doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen that's supplied to Earth's ecosystems by this atmospheric, what we call atmospheric deposition. Projections suggest that these rates are likely to increase even further in some regions in the coming decades because of increasing human population, land clearing, food production. And so now I want to step back. This elevated nitrogen supply, it is shifting the balance of elements available for organisms to grow on Earth, and it's likely impacting all of Earth's living systems, not just agriculture, not just water resources. So I want to shift my focus a bit to think about Earth's non-agricultural grasslands. And I'm going to focus on these because they're present on every continent on Earth. They're an increasingly critical ecosystem for climate and for other global change solutions. And they're really a key biome for supporting humans. You can see the grazing image here. And really for the purposes of thinking about elements like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, I also wanna point out that grasslands store about 20% of Earth's soil carbon. So soil carbon, while it's basically invisible, it's a lot more resilient to climate change effects like fire than carbon stored above ground in trees. So from the perspective of understanding future Earth, it's really important to understand how changing supplies of phosphorus and nitrogen are going to affect the long-term storage of grassland soil carbon. And so these changes in the relative supply of elements, they lead me to ask a pretty fundamental question, which is how will natural systems respond to imbalanced nitrogen and phosphorus supply? But first I want to take a minute to talk about how we answer questions like this in natural systems. For me, I'm a field ecologist, right? When I have a question that I want to answer, I go out to my field site and, for example, I might dump a bunch of nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizer around in my plots and ask what happens. Um, let's say that uh, in this plot, I've added uh, nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizer and I compare that to this other plot, maybe my control plot with ambient, uh, nothing added uh, conditions, right? And I might notice that there's more plant growing. I might notice that it's greener. I might be able to document that there's a greater mass or maybe different amount of roots or different species present in those plots. But now I wanna talk about what I worry about a little bit when I do this kind of experiment and ask about what's happening in natural systems is can we scale up? There's a really wide range of conditions on earth, right? Both abiotic or non-biological like nitrogen deposition and changes in climate like precipitation and temperature and biotic like patterns of primary productivity which is a measure of plant growth and and which species are in which locations and and so on but 
my single site work that may show really big effects, it's done under only one set of conditions. So I wonder if the response that I see would be the same if I repeated my experiment in, let's say, Brazil or Russia or central China, where conditions are really different. Can I scale up from my work and even come close to answering that really big global question about future grasslands that I just posed? So what we really need is an experiment that's replicated around the world under all kinds of different conditions, right? Done exactly the same way, but that's laughable, right? I could never possibly do that. How would I ever apply all those treatments and measure? Well, this is actually what we're doing. This is a map of the current distribution of the nutrient network that I lead. There's nearly 160 sites, as Matt said, in 29 countries spanning six continents, running from Tierra del Fuego in southern Argentina to Svalbard in Norway. So more than 131 degrees of latitude. And at every site, we're collecting identical data. And at most of these sites, we're implementing two exactly replicated experiments that I'll tell you about on the next slide. But with this design, we can ask which responses, plant growth, plant diversity, herbivory, respond in the same way to experimentally change nitrogen to phosphorus ratios, for example, and which ones respond differently at different sites. And for those that differ, we can ask which factors, soils or climate or the types of plants, which of those help us to understand those differences? So while this collaboration isn't just about data, there are a lot of um, elements of collaboration. It's an enormous collaboration. Um, I'm gonna focus on the data for now. At each of the sites, we're collecting observational data. So we're just going out and looking and documenting what plants are there and various characteristics of the site. And at most of these sites, we're also collecting long-term experimental data. So that's uh, numbers two and three are the experiments. In one of those, we're adding nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium with micronutrients um, in all possible combinations of those three. And in the other, we put up fences to keep out medium and large sized herbivores and we're either adding or we're not adding all the elements inside the fences. So we've been doing this work around the world for about 15 years. What are we finding? Okay, first, let's look back at that map of reactive nitrogen deposition. This is a little bit different version of it, a little more pixelated. Nonetheless, we were able to overlay our sites onto the data just using data collected without any experimental elements added. These ambient conditions, natural, naturally occurring conditions. We found that for every one kilogram of nitrogen deposition coming out of the atmosphere each year, the above ground plant mass increased by 3%. And honestly, that result just, it kind of blew my mind. That's clearly a fingerprint of humans in these worlds, the world's um, natural grasslands. So nitrogen appears to be limiting to biomass, right? The more we increase nitrogen relative to other elements, the more biomass grows in natural systems, right? Well, it's actually more complicated than that. This graph shows the elements that were experimentally added and the magnitude of the effect. In parentheses is the number of sites with a strong effect and the dots represent the average value and the bars show the range of uncertainty in that estimate. That symbol mu, uh, that indicates the micronutrients rather than listing every single one of them. And it's kind of a busy graph, but what I take away from this graph is that we see huge variation in which elements induce growth across the world's grasslands. At some sites, plants grow with more uh, with added uh, nitrogen. In some grasslands, plants grow with added phosphorus. And some sites need potassium or micronutrients or many different elements to be added before the plants will grow more. And that variation among grasslands isn't well explained just by the background soil chemistry or texture, as you might imagine. The story is more complicated, but because we're doing this experiment across a wide range of conditions, we can get insights into this. And we've learned that a key part of this story is that where soil nitrogen is low, additional nutrients increase plant growth. In this graph, each dot represents a treatment within a site and the lines show the average trends across the world's soil nitrogen. And what we see is that nutrients inside and outside of fences, that's the yellow and black, 
increased plant growth compared to the control plots. The fenced plots without nutrients have about the same biomass as control plots. Blue is zero, so not different from control plots. But where the background soil nutrients are high, adding nutrients further increases plant, gro uh, plant growth, but only where plants are protected from herbivores. So outside of fences, the herbivores eat that additional plant growth. So that plant growth is supporting the herbivores. And remember that that plant growth is the first step in soil carbon storage, which again, is an important natural climate solution. I'll come back to that in a minute. At the same time as we see increased plant growth and biomass with the increasing numbers of nutrients that's shown on the x-axis with the um, dots representing the mean effect, the average effect, each additional element added helps plants to overcome that growth limitation, whatever the identity of those elements. But we also see a loss of plant richness or a loss of the number of species in that location. So that means that each added nutrient type, whether it's high nitrogen or high phosphorus, we see the local extinction of additional plant species. And it isn't just a quick result that happens and then stops after a year or two. We see that where more elements are added, more species are lost rapidly. Look at the purple and blue lines across the number of resources on the x-axis. And then more continue to be lost through time. So a high supply and an imbalanced ratio of elements represents a really long-term concern for species conservation in the world's grasslands. Chronic nutrient inputs lead to continued species losses. And I'm happy to talk more about the identities of those species later, but I wanna cover some other important diversity effects. What about diversity of other organisms? Soil mutualists like our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, that's the soil AMF, they act like extensions of roots and they help plants to gather nutrients or where nitrogen or phosphorus is added, the soil mutualists don't really respond. But when both nitrogen and phosphorus are added, meaning that the other critical elements like magnesium and boron and zinc and molybdenum and potassium are in relatively low supply, those soil mutualists are lost. The diversity of soil mutualists declines. At the same time, soil pathogens that make plants sick increase when the N to P ratio is shifted away from the control conditions, either relatively high N or high P. There's an even larger increase in soil pathogens when N and P are in very high supply relative to other elements. So we see a shift in not only the diversity, but the composition of microbes in these ecosystems. And while we think of pathogens as bad, probably because of agriculture and possibly because of ourselves, uh, these microbes, these pathogenic microbes are important for taking live plant carbon and putting it into the soil. So soil carbon begins with plants. So changing plant growth and death should change soil carbon, right? The x-axis of this graph shows uh, all the sites for which we had the right data to ask the question. And what we see is that adding any one nutrient alone doesn't substantially increase soil carbon stocks at, excuse me, at most of the sites. That's um, what's shown in orange, pink, and red. But adding all elements together tends to increase soil carbon. The blue dots are highest at nearly every site around the world. And while there's a lot more changes caused by nitrogen and phosphorus that I'd love to tell you about, uh, like plant nutritional value and pathogens in the plants and total mass of insects, um, I want to take a minute to make another really important point, uh, final point about elements in the environment. Work by other groups looking at long-term data sets is showing that in spite of that increasing supply of nitrogen to ecosystems, there's a decline in the concentration of nitrogen in plants. Well, that's not intuitive. In large part, this may be due to the elevated CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. We're not just adding nitrogen or phosphorus, we're also adding carbon. And it looks like carbon may be taken up faster. So that means, for example, that plants are not maybe as nutritionally valuable to herbivores like insects or wild grazers or domestic livestock or humans. But I suspect that the observation of reduced nitrogen concentration in plants may also be due to increasing supplies of other elements into these ecosystems, like 
maybe leading to a reduced proportion of nitrogen in plant tissues. We don't, uh, we don't yet have the data to test this, but it's a really important frontier for research. And so I wanna summarize that what I see here is really a balance. We can't just look at a single element to really understand what's happening in natural systems. Co-limitation is the rule. I've shown you that plants and herbivores and pathogens all are responding to changing elemental supply ratios, this ecological stoichiometry. The responses vary with time, they vary through space, they vary with climate, and they change interactions with consumers. And finally, the responses are not to a single element. Biological systems within individuals to whole continents of species depend on the interplay of many different elements. So, thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I love that description of um, nitrogen and how splitting it um, takes so much energy. And it's, you know, that's why when you clap your hands, the atmosphere doesn't explode. You can tell you've, you've taught a few classes over the years. <laughs> um, we did have a, a question from Marlon. However, I think it's going to be, uh, that question is going to be more congruous with what's happening uh, later in the talk. So I'm going to hold off on that one until after Hosep speaks. Um, I did have a question or two I wanted to ask you, though, uh, while we have you on here, um, one of which is, uh, I wonder if there are some mechanisms by which uh, organizations or people can partner with NutrientNet or, or any of your other projects. I would be thrilled. Please contact me. I would love to figure out ways to do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who asked that, but yes, please. Okay, <laughs> great. And I um, also wanted to ask you, um, you know, we talk a lot about runoff from farms and the transport of nutrients off farm fields. And I'm wondering, you know, of course, we have to add nutrients to, uh, to agricultural systems. They're, they're highly artificial systems. Um, but I wonder um, when that, when those nutrients, have you studied at all the impacts of plots of land adjacent to agricultural fields and how application of nutrients to those fields has impacted the ecosystems around that? I have not taken that on yet. Um, it's certainly of interest. I feel like my plate's pretty full at the moment <laughs> with, uh, with this experiment, but I do, I find it fascinating. And one of the things that we'd like to do is actually uh, put uh, TDRs there. It's a way to measure the chemistry of the water going down into the soil um, in these plots to understand that interplay, not only of the, the nutrient elements, but also the soil chemistry and climate and et cetera, right? So that we can understand what are the factors most likely to control what is running out of these plots. Um, but that requires a grant. <laughs> so I'm working on that. <laughs> All right, good luck with that. <laughs> Great. Uh, I think we'll we'll go on to the next and uh, final talk before we get into our facilitated discussion. Josep, if you want to put up your slides at any point, that'd be great. Um, I'll read a bit of bio here. Very excited to introduce Professor Penuelas. Uh, he, he's a bigwig and he's the director of the Global Ecology Unit at the University of Barcelona. Uh, he's a highly sci cited scientist in ecology and the environment in plant and animal sciences and agricultural sciences and geosciences and in other fields. Uh, and that includes his research on nitrogen and phosphorus imbalances that he'll be discussing today. He's really one of the most respected and influential ecologists working in the world today. And uh, we're honored to have you here, Josef, and thanks so much for joining us. Are you able to share your slides? It looks like we might have some technical difficulties here. Well, while Joseph's feeling about that out, I thought I'd jump in and, and ask some questions of Elizabeth. If you sure, want. we'll go to a little facilitate a discussion <laughs> until uh, the step's ready. Yeah. Okay, so Elizabeth, great. Um, I can't help but notice, right, when you do an experiment, you add N alone and P alone, you get a bit of a bump, and then you add N and P together, and you do that. We do that in lakes. We I should essentially have the same result in my short-term experiment. So what's going on? 
So how is it possible that ecosystems end up in this place where natural ecosystems where, you know, if if N is short, P runs out pretty quickly thereafter, or if P is short, N runs out pretty quickly thereafter. Why does it, it seems to work in both directions? Is there a biogeochemical magic going on out there that you might speculate about? Yeah, I guess I would think about what's an organism made of, right? So <laughs> I I, I guess it, it gets a little bit Liebig, right? So thinking about the uh, balance of the different elements coming into those systems and what the organisms are taking up and needing. But yeah, I don't know. Have you thought about it in your system? What's going on in your <laughs> algae? <laughs> well, we're thinking about a lot because of, as we saw in flat, like, because the oceans don't work like this. The oceans seem to maintain a, that, that 16 magic 16 to one ratio of N to P. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and right. which is really weird, right? Because it's sort of like one part of the ocean knows that the other part of the ocean doesn't have enough nitrogen or has too much. And the way I think about it is that when you get a high entropy ratio in organic matter, a lot of production, then that goes somewhere. It has a lot of carbon with it. When it, then it goes somewhere and decomposes and uh, then it deoxygenates the water. And then that blows the nitrogen off. And then that brings the entropy ratio back down. And then you take that low entropy ratio and you put it back at the surface. And now it starts growing things. But now nitrogen runs out and the end fixers come in and bring it back up. So it seems like there's a natural sort of yeah. um, so, thermostat, stoichiostat. So even, <laughs> even within what you're saying, I guess I would, um, I would, I'm hearing one of my hypotheses with that ocean result, <laughs> which is, turnover of species, right? And so in terrestrial systems, we have a much slower turnover of species than we do have um, elements coming in and being used, right? And so if you see, you know, end fixers coming in or, you know, different species coming in and leaving, leaving, going extinct, uh, then, you know, you see different functions of those species um, being played out in the system. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, with added, elements, we have a turnover of different species. We see different functional groups. So the legumes or the, the forbs, the non-nitrogen fixing flowering plants versus the grasses, right? And so, you know, the native species, the non-native species, they're responding in different ways to the nitrogen and the phosphorus through longer periods of time. And I suspect that's what's happening just on a much faster time scale in certainly oceans. And I don't know why your lakes aren't doing that. <laughs> well, I think it's because our lakes aren't, don't have that, that scale to operate across. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, if you've been talking to our colleague, Bob Sterner, your colleague at the University of Minnesota, he'll tell you this is what's going on in Lake Superior as well. It's sort of building up nitrate over time, becoming stoichiometrically more and more stoichiometrically imbalanced. The Flathead Lake is sort of constant, but Lake Superior seems to be building up nitrogen and the speculation there from he and Jacques Finlay and others is that there's nowhere in the lake is to look at trophic as phosphorus goes down, the lake doesn't produce enough organic matter to take the nitrogen, take the oxygen away mm -hmm. during decomposition. So it never has a chance to denitrify. And so it just keeps building up the end. And so I guess, you know, your story about species coming and going, maybe it's a little plant centric. What, where, where's the denitrification going? Yeah, I don't know. So where does the nitrogen yeah, go that, in, this, it, in, in your systems? I mean, I guess one of the things that we're seeing is a huge turnover in the microbes in the soils as well, right? And so, yeah, that's it's not totally plant centric. There are microbes involved here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but wait, hey, I actually want to add something here, which is I think I met you in 2005. And I was planning a field experiment where I was just going to add big patches of N because that's what we do in terrestrial systems. And we were chatting over coffee and you asked me what was wrong with me and why wasn't I looking at pee? And I redesigned, redesigned the entire experiment to look at N and P together. And we found some really surprising things. And that's actually part of what led to downstream, the design of the nutrient network experiment was, oh yeah, let's look at all of them. <laughs> Let's not just focus on this terrestrial thing. So well, that that's ironic because actually earlier, Mike, or even before the you know I met you before in, in the '90s, even and hey, God, the '80s possibly. My main thing was to tell limnologists to pay more attention to nitrogen. 
uh, that uh, was sort so- of my role in life was to say, hey, you know, this phosphor centric view of lakes has got a, you know, a limitation yeah. on it. And that was, um, you know, my thing for several, you know, for the earliest part of my career. So it's interesting that the arguments just, you know, well, like, say that- what we need is a balance in our lives, right? Exactly. <laughs> a little stoichiometric balance here. You, uh, yeah, you opened my eyes to the phosphorus, but I didn't stop there. <laughs> Let's check in and see. Uh, Josep, are you available now? Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Let's okay, we'll put perfect. our cameras off and we'll let you uh, go into your presentation. I've already read your bio, so uh, I think you can, if you share your screen, we should be able to uh, go ahead into that presentation. I already shared my screen. Do you, don't you see my screen? I'm not seeing your screen, no. Oh, and then um, we are again in, in trouble. You don't see it now? Now is yet. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. So, so thanks for your presentation. I, I, I hear it. Sorry I, that you, you couldn't hear to me because I had my microphone out. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, let's let's talk about what Jim and you told me to talk about. That is to take into account phosphorus, but uh, regarding the interactions with carbon and nitrogen, these other elements. As Elizabeth, uh, we are really interested not only in carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, but also in all the other ones. We call them the elementum. We have difficulties with the editors because they don't like this word. But anyway, so we are very interested not only in phosphorus, but in the relationship with the other elements. So let, uh, let's put two examples of the, the importance of these interactions. Let's, let's just uh, oh, go. Uh, to, first of all, let's let's see the, an example of interaction between carbon and phosphorus. And to, to do that, what I brought you today here is something that is really hot in science, in society, and uh, an economy. That is the, the relationship between the carbon uptake and climate. And in this case, which is the relationship between carbon sequestration and phosphorus. And for that, let's remind something so simple like this one. We, we have seen that already in the previous presentations of Jim and Elizabeth. We humans are fertilizing the biosphere. Why? Because we are adding huge amounts of carbon. We all know that. Yeah, we care about climate, but uh, most of you know that if you put a lot of CO2, it's like putting a lot of food to your plants. So we are fertilizing plants with CO2. But we are also fertilizing our planet with these huge amounts of nitrogen we are adding. You see this, this, this graph uh, is increasing to the point that now we humans are putting into the biosphere more nitrogen that is fixed naturally both in continents and oceans. Why? Because we are adding fertilizers, we are adding nitrogen from, from fuel combustion, and we are adding a lot of nitrogen fixation from cropland. But also, we are also warming our planet. And by, by warming, what we are doing is in all these uh, studies that we have conducted, we see that there is an advancement in the leaf on set. There is an advancement in the spring. I'm, I am not going to go into detail on the heterogeneity, depending on the region, of course. But globally, we have uh, earlier springs in the, northern, in the northern latitudes. And we not only... Not only that, but uh, um, in response to this warming, what we are seeing is that there is a delay in the end of the season. We see that with remote sensing data, like in this world. We see that with ground data, like in this world. But at the end, what matters here, for what I, I, I mean to, to, put, uh, in, uh, to present here, is that we have a longer growing period. So we are fertilizing and we are having a, long, a longer growing period. What does it mean for carbon? Does it mean that we really are enhancing, increasing carbon sinks because we are increasing primary productivity? This is what we, we this was our, our hypothesis. We are adding carbon, we are adding nitrogen, we are warming, so we have longer periods of growth. So our question is, do we really see in the earth an increase in the carbon uptake? And to know that, to answer that, what we do is to use the data that we have as scientific community. And the first thing that uh, came to our mind was to work in medical variance towers. We have as community many all over the world, now more than 400 or 500, I, I don't know how many now, but uh, several hundred of towers. 
when we put together the data of dogs that have longest time series uh, of data, we see that yes, there is an increase in the net ecosystem productivity in most of them, 70% against 30%. And then we see uh, in which ones of these sites there is a higher NEP. And it's those that are at the same time that are seeing the increase in CO2 are seeing an increase in the nitrogen deposition that we have seen in the previous talk. And then uh, we, we are not happy only with the covariance. We want to, to use other data. And we use the data that we, we have for CO2 all over the world and do inverse modeling analysis with different models. This is always controversial. We don't have time at all. Each one of these slides would deserve a, an entire talk. But the idea here, I brought, I brought this slide here only to remind that inverse modeling of CO2 data tells us the same thing, increasing, uh, increasing trends in the net ecosystem productivity. And the, same, and the same we get even if we use uh, uh, Earth system models. So models also uh, tell us a similar story, an increasing trend of carbon uptake. And, and which is the main fact or which are the main drivers? It seems by using these statistical models that the main factor, as also was mentioned by Elizabeth, it seems that is the increase in CO2, either if we use this data for uh, inverse modeling or this data for models. But no, it's not enough. We can also use the data that we have in Mauna Loa and Point Barro and study the, the amplitude that we see every year in this electrocardiogram of, of our planet that you have in your mind is the CO2 curves, this up and down. And this amplitude has been increasing in all these uh, different stations where we measure CO2. And mostly, mostly there is an increase uh, that we attribute to different factors, CO2, climate, land use, and so on. So this also goes in the same line. And then we also can use, and I will stop here of all these big data sets that we can use to answer this question of carbon uptake and use remote sensing data. And you know that what we see is that there is a, a, a global greening of our planet. There has been a global greening in 4% four, four of, the, of the area is browning, 25, 50% is greening. The, other, the, other, the rest of the percentage, there are no significant changes, but you see that there is a greening. So confirming this uh, uh, greening train attribute attributed is mostly to CO2, to increase elevated CO2 that is, as we said, a kind of fertilization. Unless, but also to warming, to nitrogen deposition, or even to land cover change. Here we do all this kind of uh, discriminant or statistical analysis to disentangle this. But so yes, the fertilization of the biosphere increases NPT and carbon sinks. This is what we thought. But then we are never happy with that. <coughs> and we always uh, have to to, uh, to wonder whether we are doing right or not, because the next thing to ask is for how long the, uh, can our biosphere uh, uh, suck or, or uptake so many, that much carbon. And then one starts thinking in phosphorus, not only in phosphorus, but in all the other elements, because plants uh, don't live only on carbon and, and nitrogen. They also need phosphorus, then sulfur, potassium, calcium, magnesium, you know, uh, if you are farmers, or if you, if you are environmentalists, if you are uh, academics, you perfectly know that. And we are not going to, to remind once more that one of the key factors, the uh, key elements in life is phosphorus. And what happened with phosphorus? That we now have an increasing demand. Demand is growing continuously in our planet because we have an increasing CO2, an increasing nitrogen, and a longer growing periods. But at the same time, what happens with the supply of phosphorus? The supply of phosphorus is limited. It only there is a little amount, an uncertain from, uh, from uh, atmospheric deposition. Uh, 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 in, it's difficult to free up the, the soil in phosphorus and uh, uh, both the organic and mineral. So what the next step is to wonder which is the, uh, the, uh, which, uh, is the relative importance of the supply relative to the demand. And what we measured was, or we estimated, the phosphorus deposition. And from the, from the air, the deposition is, is substantial, but it's very far away from what is needed uh, regarding to the demand. Here we have the data of phosphorus deposition, pre-industrial, the carbon one, 
and what we forecast or project for next uh, uh, decades. And then uh, it's not only from above that we can obtain phosphorus, when I say we, I mean vegetation and biosphere, but also uh, biosphere and vegetation fight for getting more phosphorus when they have a lot of nitrogen. If we study that, the higher the concentration or the availability of nitrogen, the higher the phosphatases that are in, in, in the soil, where both plants and microbes fight to get what they don't have as much, that is phosphorus, when they have a lot of nitrogen. But, that, but even, even with this help from above and from below, it's, it's if we really calculate the stichiometry, the proportion of carbon and phosphorus, that all these models, air system models, carbon models, climate models that we have tested, uh, you, can, you, will, you will realize that the productivity or even the stock or the biomass will require so many, uh, so many teragrams of phosphorus, ad additional ones that is not possible, at least with our knowledge, and unless uh, some adaptation on, or some crazy way of getting, of uh, freeing up uh, phosphorus appears from now on. Yeah. So, uh, and so with this with this information, we prepare all these uh, maps that tell us about uh, or forecast the, the phosphorus limitation regarding different different ways to obtaining it for different regions or, or different scenarios. This is moderate climate warming scenario, more extreme one. In all of them, you see blue indicating that we project a deficit of uh, phosphorus in many regions of the world for the next decades. And at the end, what we have is less biomass than projected previously in, in all these uh, earth system models and climate models. And if this is true, then uh, we need to correct or at least revisit many of the, the climate projections that uh, we have currently. Yeah? And if we do that, uh, it's not encouraging because we, we we get the results like this one, for example, where all these areas from Europe and Asia or, or North America will, uh, in, the, in the last decades of the century, have a negative relationship with the temperature uh, instead of a positive one as they had until now. And, and you could say, well, all this is the future, and this is what we wonder. Is well, the future and projecting the future is always difficult. Yeah, it's more than difficult. And we just uh, uh, provide or put together the knowledge and try to make projections. But what do we really have already? Already, what we have already is that uh, something that was was also mentioned by by Elizabeth. If we study the, the nutrient concentrations, the phosphorus concentrations, the nitrogen concentrations, the potassium concentrations in our forest, and for to do that uh, we only had the data from Europe, but for the whole Europe, what we are seeing is a decrease in the in the nitrogen, in the foliar nitrogen concentrations with years from the 90s up to now, uh, and also from uh, for phosphorus. And again, there is this increasing imbalance in nitrogen. It's not only that decrease the, concent the concentrations of these elements that they are decreasing, but also the, the imbalance is, or the ratio between them is changing with all these uh, possible uh, consequences that we have seen in the previous talk. Here, uh, the, the other interesting thing is that uh, what I am telling you very simple and very fast uh, regarding global responses, uh, we must always take into account that each locality, each site, each region has its own idiosyncrasy and it's different. For example, these decreasing, decreasing concentrations of nutrients in the forest, or, uh, in the different species of the forest of Europe, you, you see that here is not well, very well seen, but you, you see that this brown, brown is a decrease. But for example, you already see that nitrogen is increasing in, in northern countries where the warmer temperatures are facilitating mineralization, for example, of, of nitrogen and make it more available, we guess. But it's not the case for phosphorus or for potassium. Or even if we put, this is very complicated uh, uh, graph, but uh, please uh, take it uh, so simple as brown or orange is, uh, let's say, uh, lower nutrient concentrations in a lower nu uh, nutrient status and green um, higher nutrient concentrations in the leaves of the, all these different three species, the dominant species in forest in, in Europe. And you will see that while in Northern Europe, 
there is uh, an uh, uh, a shift from conditions that were poor to richer in nutrient status. In Central Europe, they go down, and in Southern Europe, they even go uh, farther down. You see that uh, the previous decades is the empty, the empty elliptic, and the full one is what's going on now. Yeah. So uh, we already see these differences that uh, are related to what we projected as a result of this uh, fertilization that is imbalanced in, in uh, the provision of nutrients. And then uh, let's revisit our, our uh, greening of our planet. Is look at the left uh, uh, row of, of uh, plots, and you will see that, that uh, uh, this one is the one that I, I show you, that mostly green, comparing nowadays with uh, the 80s or the 90s. But please pay attention that if we uh, represent uh, the instantaneous instead of the, this is the accumulated difference. But if we go to instantaneous, you will see that we had the greening mostly at the 80s and 90s, but we don't have uh, as much greening nowadays. Yeah, this, that we have a decline in this greening. And, and if we put all this together and look uh, globally, the data that we have for remote sensing, and we wonder which is the, uh, the pace of the fertilization of this planet with CO2 that is increasing the carbon uptake, we realize that in the 80s, it was 30% of change every uh, 100 parts per million of CO2. And nowadays it's around uh, 15, 10. So it's true that our planet has captured more carbon and it's capturing more carbon, but every time at a, a slower pace and nutrients and phosphorus and nitrogen have a lot to say here because what we see is that is in all in the areas where the, where the concentrations of nutrients are lower are those where we have uh, a, a stronger decrease in the fertilization capacity. So this, this in part explains the ratio between residual lancing and total emissions that you see that is decreasing. Yeah, in, this, in the 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was higher than, than in, in recent uh, years. And as a result of that, we have this figure that most of you have seen, I guess, that is that we have an increasing uh, addition of CO2 uh, to the atmosphere to the point that is increasing every year more. There is an acceleration instead of a constant increase. In the 60s, there was around one PPM every year of increase. And nowadays we have uh, more than two. And which is the reason, of course, is the increased activity of the global economy. But uh, the decrease in the efficiency of natural things that goes related both to nutrient deficits, or phosphorus, for example, but also uh, we didn't have time to talk about that, but also because of uh, especially uh, the climate change that is translated in less water and, and, and higher temperatures is explaining around one fifth of this uh, acceleration in the atmospheric CO2 enrichment. Okay, so uh, the, the, limit, the, the fertilization with carbon seems uh, to be limited by the availability of phosphorus and other nutrients mm -hmm. and, uh, and also climate change. This is the, the first message I wanted to, to brought to you. The, while comparing when Jim and Matt asked me to talk about carbon and, and phosphorus, this is the example that I thought would be interesting globally. It's plenty of other examples that, that tell us about the importance of this stoichiometry, this relative proportion of, of elements. But this is one that is key to understand what's going on in this planet and in this, in this moment of climatic emergency and the role that phosphorus can play there too. But, let, but the, the other one is, is uh, if I have time, is not only with carbon, but the relationship between phosphorus and nitrogen. And for that, uh, uh, we also have, uh, we are creating with this, uh, as was already said in the previous talk, we already, we already have, all, we also have an imbalance, not only in nitrogen phosphorus, but in the, in the other elements, but let's focus in, in this relationship between nitrogen and phosphorus. Again, remind the first slides, uh, where we show that nitrogen is increasing and fertilizing the earth, but phosphorus is also increasing, but not at the same pace. So as a result of this, uh, excuse me, and it, there, are, there are areas where the phosphorus is increasing a lot. Yeah, I'm talking mostly about uh, natural conditions and wild lands, but in, in those areas where there is a high life density or high 
uh, human uh, human population in those areas there is also uh, an imbalance but the other way around there is too much phosphorus okay so these are two different imbalances that we can create as a result in our in our biosphere we have uh, many many places where we have an imbalance that is shifting towards more nitrogen and carbon but in some areas like the areas that you saw with the algal bloom what we have is is the is the other way around a shift in the whole element of the whole compost elemental composition of organisms and communities and ecosystems uh, shifted towards phosphorus and and but globally what we have is is this if we make just the proportion between the nitrogen that we are adding and the phosphorus that we are adding you see that from the 80s to nowadays we have changed the global np ratio from 19 to 30. this is huge this is huge and, and this is huge and comes not only from the air, like here, the, the ratio between nitrogen and phosphorus in the northern hemisphere is twice, five times, 10 times, even 20 or 20 times higher now, nowadays than in the, in, in the 80, 800s, okay? And, and this, you can wonder, but you have seen already the very interesting talk uh, presentations of Jim and, and Elizabeth, that if we, if we are adding from the air around 30, you can wonder which is the normal one of, of soil. Soil is between 16 and 22, so it's much higher. And it's also much higher than what is in the plants. And it's also, it's also much higher than what is in the water and what is in the plankton. Yeah. So one can immediately think that uh, we, are, we are going to create a shift in the conditions of, uh, of all these uh, organisms and ecosystems. Or, or, or even here we, here we calculated the NP ratio of uh, plants and you see that they are all, even, even when they are highest, they are not so high as this nitrogen deposition. Mm -hmm. Or if we go to, instead of uh, just focusing in terrestrial ecosystems, we also can focus in lakes. This is because uh, I guess that Jim would like better to talk about lakes. Yeah, in lakes, what we see is that there, there are also continuously increasing imbalances created by our activities, even from our activities of treating wastewater plants. But in this case, what we did in this study was to study all these lakes all over the world and, and try to find out which is the NP of the inflow water and the NP of the outflow. And you see that the NP of the, of the outflow, so the imbalance is enhanced in almost all these lakes as a, as a result of, of uh, of their uh, nutrient dynamics. Oh, and if you, you want to, you can, we can see here if we group the legs of the wall uh, among oligotrophic, mesotrophic, so uh, very rich, very, uh, very uh, poor in nutrients uh, until very rich in nutrients, you see that this difference between what uh, comes out from the lake and, the, and what was entering in the lake is increasing with, uh, with the richness of the lake. So, but even in, even in the oligotrophic, the difference is, look at that, even more than 10 units, okay? So, and then we, one can wonder, well, so what? So what, uh, why are you explaining all this that maybe you are even tired now of listening all these so many slides, but uh, it was already uh, presented in the previous talks, but let's summarize it. When, what do we see as a result of this NP ratio shifting towards higher values. Then both in terrestrial ecosystems here in green and in aquatic ecosystems here in blue, we have, uh, we did that two years ago, not today, not, not this year, but we review all the available data or available papers, all, avail, all the available evidence of what was going on. And for example, in terrestrial ecosystems, there were 24 articles, uh, studies showing that also, the, the NP of the soils uh, increase as a result of this increased deposition. Or in water, 55 against 11 increase NP as a result of the wastewater uh, treatment uh, delivering waters in lakes or, or rivers, or as a result of atmospheric deposition. So when we add more nitrogen relative to phosphorus, the, the substrate increases also uh, its NP ratio. And as a result of that, we studied what happened to organisms? They respond also. 32 increase relative to zero that didn't increase. We always have to have in mind that sometimes that maybe 
there is this uh, uh, publication bias, but this is quite, is so strong that it's difficult that the publication bias could uh, change this, this proportion significantly, substantially. And this is translated into the growth rate. Uh, remind the very nice slide that Jim showed uh, 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 regarding those, uh, the different lakes with different phosphorus uh, availability. So the growth rate decreases when we have NP that, I that is uh, higher. In order to have growth, it should be lower. Yeah? And this, the same, this, this in lakes, this in, in soils and, and terrestrial ecosystems. And when this happens, happens differently depending on the species. So as a result of this, we see what uh, Elizabeth was explaining to us, that there are changes in the community structure. Yeah? 33 papers against zero. And, and in, in aquatic, 56 against zero. So in 56 studies that reported, uh, the, the effect of this uh, NP ratio changing was a change in the, in the structure of the community. And when the structure changes, we see uh, changes in the ecosystem function, both in aquatic ecosystems and in terrestrial ecosystems. So, but this is, this is in nature, but uh, uh, we humans are part of nature. And we, sometimes we think that we are different, but, but anyway, as we are part of nature, we are also uh, not suffering, but we, we are also object of response of what's going on. And for example, uh, if we care about food security, we, we will see that uh, all those countries that have difficulties of having phosphor, uh, phosphates uh, as fertilizers, like in Africa mostly, they have uh, NP ratios very high and their productivities are very low or, have a or are at least limited. So this that we are explaining is not the only useful for the, uh, the, uh, the copepoda or for the macroinvertebrates of the soil, but what is also very important for another species in this planet that is our, our species. And, and when we talk about food security, we should also think about socioeconomic responses of our society. And here again, with phosphorus, we have, we have a key issue in, in, in regarding these uh, different imbalances, or, or even for phosphorus itself. Remember that uh, our world has uh, different kinds of countries. There are the phosphorus-rich countries, like Morocco, that what they care is about maximizing the profit. But uh, together with him, there are phosphorus, the phosphorus, uh, excuse me, phosphorus producers. And then there are the phosphorus rich countries like Europe or US that uh, we don't care much about the price, but we, because we are so rich that we can pay and we care is about uh, security in, in the supply. But then there are other third kind of countries that they don't care, about, they, don't, they care mainly about the availability of good price, uh, at a good price. So I don't explain very well, but you can understand quickly that the aims and the interests are so different that this creates such a trilemma in the international market, in the international geopolitical relationships that is hidden in many of the problems that are related to, to many of these socioeconomic and, and, and even bellic problems. For example, here in Spain, uh, if we fight against Morocco, we'll have to fight against US because you and US are protecting Morocco because they have a lot of, they have the control of phosphorus. Or if, if uh, Israel uh, has not the control of, of potassium, uh, but uh, I, I am talking too much and I don't know well this, but what I mean here is that we, what we see in our animals and plants is also the same for humans uh, regarding the food security, regarding their the relationships between the different communities, different populations of humans. And also for humans, uh, uh, the, uh, is, I guess that this is one of the last uh, slides that I have here, is also uh, these imbalances like in, in, in animals and and plants create uh, these functions. And uh, one that uh, we thought that could be important is if we continuously add nitrogen and not phosphorus, for example, but for example, these days we are adding uh, 10 times more uh, nitrogen fertilizers in our wheat uh, fields that, than when I was born in the 60s. Yeah? And this is translated into higher productivity, but not in 10 times higher productivity, higher yield. It's translated in three times higher yield. But most of this nitrogen ends up in proteins in, in, the, in the wheat grains. And, and most of these proteins are gliadins. And gliadins are, uh, are uh, in the basis of all these uh, immunological and allergenic and, and problems related to celiac disease. So 
uh, it's difficult to, and uh, this is a work for the medical uh, scientists to prove whether there is a, a mechanistic uh, relationship, but from the point of view of the statistical correlations, we see that in many places, this increase in, in the prevalence of celiac disease in nowadays society has gone in parallel with the increase in the gliadin content of uh, flour from, from wheat as a result of this imbalance in or this uh, nitrogen fertilization that we are adding to, to our uh, field crops. So at the end, uh, uh, to finish, uh, with all this that we are discussing today, uh, we scientific community, we, uh, let's say, uh, ma uh, environmental manage managers and, and all the people that care about our planet and care about the, the planetary boundaries and the sustainable development goals. Uh, uh, we, you, know, you know well, I guess, most of you, these planetary boundaries. I think that uh, we, should, we should revisit some of them. For example, climate change, I think that we are not in increasing risk, but we are already in high risk here, and it is still in yellow. But regarding what matters today is that I think that we should take into account not only that nitrogen is a problem, not only that phosphorus is a problem when we add too much or when we have too little, but what matters after the, the meeting or excuse me, the meeting, the seminar that we have today is that we should care about these imbalances so the, the relative proportions between these two key elements for life and not forget that it's not only carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus what we need to live, but also we need potassium, molybdenum, calcium and so on. And we should take care about all this uh, elemental composition that is, is key for our, uh, our, uh, our health and our, uh, the sustainability of our planet. And I think that this, this is, is all, I, I think I, I talk too much, right, Matt? <laughs> no, it was great. No, Steph, don't worry at all about that. Thanks okay, for that sorry. presentation. No, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, we still have 10 minutes left uh, to oh, have a discussion. Okay. And, you know, we've had some already. We did have a couple questions come in. Um, you can uh, try to answer these if you want. I can uh, chime in or anyone of uh, the panelists can answer them as well. And then after that, we'll go into a bit of just uh, facilitated discussion led by Jim. But um, uh, okay. we had some questions about sort of technological fixes, I guess, to the nitrogen issues. Um, one of them was, um, uh, this came from Marlon, he uh, says, um, I know we can recover nutrients and recycle them uh, from wastewater. So struvite precipitation would be an example of this. Um, are there other techniques for valor valorizing wastewater components other than this sort of intentional mineral precipitation that can be used to address uh, the amount of nitrogen that we're pumping out to uh, our lakes and rivers and streams, et cetera. Maybe Jim or? Jim, if you want to take it, or I can take it either. I'll why, why, why do you take that one, Matt? Yeah, sure. So um, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, we have, we have a colleague, uh, Dr. Bruce Rittman, who won the Stockholm Water Prize uh, just a couple of years back, and he, his career has been focused a lot on how we use um, microbes to uh, harness energy and other uh, components of wastewater and turn them into products that you know are of use. So, you know, there's a lot of carbon in wastewater, for example, and you can turn that into biogas. And so. One of the things that um, we look at is, are there sort of suites of technologies that we can implement simultaneously to extract value, a total package of value out of the wastewater? And I saw earlier that uh, Brooke Mayer was on the line. She's written some great papers on, on just this topic. But um, yeah, so you know, if you want nitrogen specifically, I'm not really as familiar with how that extraction happens. Uh, or, or what those valorization processes look like, but there's all sorts of stuff in wastewater. I mean, even, even trace amounts of precious metals, for example, are in there. And so you can sort of package those together and, and um, use those collectively as a way to treat the wastewater further and, and remove nitrogen. I'm not, I haven't seen a lot of evidence that there's great concern about the nitrogen phosphorus balance in, in these waters that are being discharged. And that might be a next frontier for the, for the treatment industry. So I hope that works as an answer for now, at least, uh, Marlon. And another question that came up was, can we convert inorganic nitrogen back to nitrogen gas through biological or chemical denitrification? 
um, is their role for this in, in bringing back the balance. And that one I can't answer at all. So <laughs> if someone else can take a crack at that. Uh, well, yes, we can. Um, in fact, that's what goes on in a lot of wastewater treatment plants that, that uh, undergo it, that perform anaerobic digestion or anaerobic breakdown of wastewater that causes denitrification. Um, a denitrification step. Um, not all wastewater treatment plants do that, though. And in fact, most of them, because of local practices or regulation or what's being targeted, will differentially remove the phosphorus from the wastewater and discharge the nitrogen. And Joseph and I are on a paper that analyzed the impacts of this in China as they're bringing advanced wastewater treatment plants on there to counteract eutrophication. Their lakes have been heavily fertilized by wastewater and other sources, developing very low N to P ratios and algal blooms. And they've been doing a really good job in getting wastewater treatment online in China, been targeting uh, and targeting phosphorus, but not targeting the nitrogen. And so now they're driving the N to P ratios in the other direction. And the question is, I think, you know, is that we need to start thinking about, okay, what is our target? What would we like? the entropy ratio of loading of lakes to be like. I guess we'll bring our videos on now, Matt. Yeah, sure. That's great. And, um, and to me, this is also something that may be contributing here at Flathead Lake and to talk about what it takes because they target phosphorus here, do a very good job of it actually. Um, most of our nitrogen is coming in from natural sources, but if we want to get entropy ratios and more in balance for all kinds of reasons, then um, we need a more yeah. balanced approach to wastewater treatment. Uh, let, let, let me add to this that Jim is, is, is explaining. Let me add that, for example, we are very interested in this because in many, many uh, of these uh, cases, the wastewater plant treatment, or treatment plant, excuse me, uh, they, they, they remove the phosphorus. And then as, as Jim is saying, they increase again the nitrogen phosphorus. And for example, many of our rivers that were, uh, were full of, uh, let's say, phytoplankton, they were green. And now they are they are transparent, yeah. But this has changed completely the ecology of our rivers to the point that now the macrophytes are growing on the floor, and with macrophytes uh, the the black fly, and uh, all the neighbors, all the population of uh, around these rivers is is complaining about our removing the phosphate from from the from the the ponds and and, and the lakes and the rivers. So uh, again, is another example that the, 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 the new balance between nitrogen and phosphorus is something that we have to study well because we call it this re uh, oligo eutrification Do you understand what I mean, re oligo eutrification No, well, yeah. So, uh, but then we have another problem. So, so we must be careful with, uh, with all these treatments. But uh, yes, if, of course, this is, this is very interesting and also for recycling phosphorus especially in, in, in areas where phosphorus is, as we, as we said before, is expensive, yeah. yeah great, okay. uh, Jim, we really only have a, a minute or so here, but if you have a quick question you wanna throw out there, we can. All right, I guess, we well, yeah, we don't have a lot of time for final, for wrapping up, but let me just ask, um, what are we gonna do? Uh, <laughs> we have nutrients blowing around all over globally. They're coming, going from place to place. They're going in different proportions in different places. Um, what are the mechanisms? What policies, what technologies, what innovations, what changes do we need? And in one minute or less, uh, <laughs> Elizabeth, what would you do to try to bring uh, the nitrogen phosphorus cycles into a better balance? In terms of policies, I'm going to pass it off to you, Josep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not working in the policy. I'm trying to work in the discovery. So the foundation of the building rather than the, the solutions. Um, yeah. While I'm deeply interested in the solutions, I feel like we need to have a, a foundational understanding. Well, but yes, I'm right. working more in the policy. All, all right. right. So, so Yosef, you called out Science Magazine just a couple months ago. You called out for, you know, governments of the world and elsewhere to uh, gather together and bring uh, new innovation in policy and approaches to bring yes, stoichiometric. Yes. I am more. I am more. What, I, what are you talking about? No, I, I am more into, in the same field than Elizabeth. But but of course, as a result of what we are seeing, is 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 the reason that we are now reaching the let's say the stakeholders, the managers, and for example, now we just asked the, to the European government to create a new directive, uh, directive, uh, new law, because we have laws only for nitrogen. And thanks to, to works and seminars like this one, 
we are now trying to influence, and I think they will agree, to put phosphorus and not only phosphates, not only phosphorus and phosphates, but also the ratio between them. Uh, so uh, as a result of what we are discussing here, I think that we can reach them. And this will, this will be introduced now in the European uh, uh, environmental laws, and I guess that in US and also in China we try to. But uh, all these kind of uh, technological solutions, we, we need to work on that, as you mentioned also, and to discover uh, the, how the microbiota can help us. Mm? But anyway, it's, it's difficult to solve because uh, we humans are really altering everything with not much knowledge on what we are doing. All right, with that, I think we have to finish up. Um, Thank you all. It was a great discussion, great presentations, and I appreciate the time you put into putting them together. Uh, I do want to remind everyone to please keep on your radars Phosphorus Week. Um, I hope everyone can make it out there November 1st through 4th. It's going to be quite an agenda for those four days and the, the big event for Phosphorus for the year. So uh, please, please do show up. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth, Osef, Jim, for, for participating, uh, and thank you all for attending the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series today. Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.